is just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Dr. Mark L. Nevins, DMD, MMSC. He's the executive chairman of Little Implant Company and inventor of the Mark Nevins Dental Implant System. He is in private practice at Periodontology and Dental Implants in Boston, Massachusetts. He's a diplomat of the American Board of Periodontology, associate professor of oral medicine, infection and immunity at Harvard School of Dental Medicine, and serves as editor in chief of the International Journal of Periodontics and Restorative Dentistry. Um, it is just beyond a huge honor to have you come on my show today. Um, I want to start off, um, Dr. Nevins, is um, the, the, these kids listening to you, they're going to walk out of school $400,000 in debt, and guess how many dental implants they placed in school? Probably none. I, I, I hope that some of them had a chance to at least restore some in school. <laughs> So, you know, how, so it, how do you think? I think, it, I, think it, I think it depends on which university and which school they're at, though, probably. Well, if I meet someone who plays a dental implant in a dental school, I will um, run the Boston Marathon um, dressed as a tooth fairy. Um, how do you go from coming out of dental school and just read about it in textbooks or online to placing your first implant? I think that uh, the most important thing is the education program. And I think for most uh, people who have not had the experience of at least restoring implants, that they need to uh, begin at the beginning, which is an education program, which is restorative driven, focusing on the endpoint of uh, what the restoration is gonna be, and then planning the surgical placement based on that. And it's gonna give them fundamentals to choose them which cases they should be starting with in which cases they might want to uh, put in the referral basket so that they can build on successes. We want to build on successful outcomes and build build confidence that way. At Little, Little Implant Company, we have a wide range of educational experiences. So uh, students could go to a two-day uh, mini residency program, we call it, where they'll get basic lecture, basic hands-on, and be able to observe multiple uh, surgeries with surgical placements. And we also have programs with over-the-shoulder teaching uh, in, in several locations where students, uh, uh, dentists can have over-the-shoulder education and they can do the surgery themselves. So I think, you know, depending on how much experience someone has had on the restorative side, that might guide them as to the best approach starting out on the education side. And we try to sort of meet meet people at whatever whatever level they're at now. We try to meet them there and then help them expand their horizons and get the confidence to get the experience and succeed. Okay, so these hands-on, now your website company is littleimplantco.com. Yes. So littleimplantcompany.com. Yes. Why did you yeah. name it Little Implant Company? Where did that name come from? Well, we're, just, we're you know we're just we're we're just a little company, <laughs> you know, and it, you know sort of a pun on that because we we think that we we have a special pro product and a special approach, and we think that uh, you know over time our little implant company might grow a little bit. We have many unique aspects you know before we, we get to the product we're talking about education and we have a mentoring program built into our implant company so every time that you receive your implant and you open that box and your implant there's a little card in there giving you access to a clinical mentor in our uh, is that your mentor uh, in a box program that is our mentor in a bo in a bo in a box program. Congratulations and on that and the name and everything. That that was why I called you. You didn't call me. I called you, yeah. and I thought that mentor in a box. And I thought that was genius yeah. concept, genius With, marketing. Some of our mentors right now, including Tony Feck, David Little. Gary M, Pamela Ray, and that mentor in a box program gives you access to them. You can uh, email them if you uh, and get a communication right back within a day, or set up a time to communicate directly, even on telephone. Because if you need help assessing a case, reviewing a CT scan, or just a question about the instrumentation, to have someone there who's a clinical expert and be able to build a relationship with them. 
we really want to take it very seriously how to meet clinicians where they are with their implant experience and help them grow their practices in any way we can it's it's not we have a great product but it's not all about products it's about customer service and it's about being there to give the give professional support that's needed and i, I think that's unique in the industry the, and it seems like you're um, more focused. I mean, I look at your um, your lectures, and they seem to be more of um, um, Kentucky, Kansas City, San Antonio. Is that um, is that pretty much true? Is that is that um, we 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 have uh, education centers in the in those areas, and we'll expand the geography of that as we move forward in time. Um, but those have been working working well right now, and we will we will uh, plan on an expansion of that over time as far as geographic locations. And depending on on uh, which types of programs, it may be that some programs will be in certain places, and some larger lectures or uh, surgical demonstrations may be in others. But right now, those are our main centers. Yes, and we have we have uh, a series of programs, uh, including many residencies set up in, in uh, Kansas City in March and May, in Lexington, Kentucky in May, and uh, coming up in San Antonio in June. And then we have some advanced courses uh, coming up real soon. Um, there's uh, one this weekend in San Antonio, and then the beginning of March 9th, another one in San Antonio, and then at the end of March in Kansas City. The full array of education programs is available online, but, but we have anything from the two-day mini residency to a dentalist course. We have a new uh, extraction socket bone grafting course. So we're trying to help people build, build the skills in, in the area, uh, areas that we think will help them expand their practice. So, um, first thing I want to get out of the way is um, there's over 400 dental implant companies, and um, the yeah. the um, Cologne meeting is the largest dental meeting in the world. It's coming up this uh, this. It's every other year. It's coming up in March, and rumor has it they have like over 250 implant companies having a booth. And this young millennial driving to work right now, she's like, you know, I don't I don't have time to go through 20 different systems, let alone 400 systems. Um, what do you tell her? Why Why your system? Why not any of the other 400 systems? Yeah, I mean, I think what's unique, you know, when we, when we um, talk about the little implant company, we are a company that's owned by clinicians and our design team is not, a marketing team and i think a lot of dental implant design has been dominated by the marketing side not all of it i mean there have been a lot of clinician designs as well but if you go to cologne and you walk around that exhibit hall uh in my eyes a lot of what i see is designed on the marketing side not on the clinical expertise and we've really focused on both the actual implant fixture itself design for the way it will go in the bone and the way the bone will respond to it biologically. And we've also focused on our surgical instrumentation design in both of those to make it easier to use, easier to place, and to be more more successful. It's a little bit of a long-winded answer, but it's a very important question. With implant design, if we think about wanting the implant to be stable in the bone, but we don't want to damage the bone. And if we think about the implant healing process, we typically think that the bone to implant um, stability might get weaker during the early couple weeks of healing before it gets stronger as new bone is laid down. So you have a uh, sort of a battle between bone resorption and new bone, bone growth. If you can reduce the uh, damage in the way the bone is drilled, in the damage by the way the implant compresses the bone, but you can still have a high stability so that implant is locked in place. Then you've been more gentle to the bone, you can have more bone apposition, more bone strengthening, and less bone weakening in the early healing period. And what we've done is designed an implant that's easy to place because of the taper design and the thread design, it locks in the bone easily at full placement, but it doesn't damage the bone. What this does, it makes it 
uh, more predictable healing, more predictable integration, faster healing, and more flexibility when you for more advanced treatments, things like immediate loading, which we've done a 12-month uh, research project on successfully, and um, more versatility. So uh, without being too lengthy, I think we've specifically looked at how our implant behaves from the way it feels to the clinician going into the bone, but the way it's going to respond biologically. And there's a lot of designs that have a lot of fancy th thread uh, pitches and thread designs, but if you can't get that into the bone without damaging the bone, then uh, it may not be the right choice. So you have, um, you have your own competitor because you have your system, and also one of your instructors is Pamela Ray. We have four diameters in the Mark Nevins implant systems. We have a 385, a 42, a 50, and a 6.0. And all those implants have the same connection, so it keeps the armamentarium very simple. In addition to that, we've designed a the little implant company has designed a uh, different 3.85 fixture known as the Pamela Ray. And this fixture has a uh, extra taper to it so it tapers down all the way to 2.2 millimeters so it's part of our narrow solutions and let's say you had a, a site with an undercut in the maxillary anterior or a lower interior where the ridge was more narrow then rather than selecting a mark nevins 385 fixture you might select the pamela ray which only comes in that 385 diameter right now which has the extra taper to it so it's part of our whole little implant uh uh system implant solution and that's one component of our narrow solution we also have a more uh narrow implant a 3.0 fixture known as the tony feck which should be coming out in uh july next this current year so we hope to have that available at the beginning of the third quarter um as part of our narrow solutions product product solution well explain Does this yeah explain this to her she's <clears throat> She's in dental school, and whenever she sees a pano of an older patient who got implants 20 years ago, they are always a straight cylinder. Why? Um, what happened to the straight cylinder design, and why do you see uh, now more tapers and conicals and things like of that sort? Yeah, yeah. The again, again, if you think about with a straight cylinder, you need to have a fairly limited. Uh, extension and cutting activity to the thread or that cylinder is going to lock in place by having a more tapered body the thread itself long as the long as the threads are spread out enough can have more extension and cutting ability what that's going to do is allow the implant to self tap into the bone if it's designed correctly but also when you get that implant into place it's going to lock in place if someone's a novice or even an experienced uh, implant surgeon and they're using an implant that's a straight fixture, it can be that sometimes the implant is too loose in the bone and sometimes it's too tight. It's a little challenging to get it just right. With a tapered design like we have, the process of placing the implant but getting a strong stability is much easier and more predictable. And again, there's other aspects of, of the design to make sure the bone behaves well. Um, but that's a really, it's an important question and why things have trended towards tapered fixtures. You know, um, when you and I were little, an implant drill kit had so many drill bits you couldn't count them. And same yeah. with root canals. I mean, my God, you'd use well, twenty different files for root canal. Listen, not when we were little. Most implant companies today have drill kits with fifteen or twenty different types of drills in it. So, so you've seen endo where they try to get it down to where a dentist just has to use a couple of files, and you exactly. you've done your what you call multi drill technology. Um, yep. how, how can you do in two uh, drill bits where, you know, when I started out 30 years ago, you'd use half a dozen or more or to a dozen? Yep, yep. So the kit's been designed where the multi-drills are step drills that are highly engineered, very precise cutting. And what I've found is a lot of the – I typically drill at 600 RPMs, and if I'm more than a 3-millimeter diameter, maybe 430, 450. And with the multi-drills, they cut so efficiently, I find myself even drilling a little bit slower, slower than that. And they're designed – if you want to go step by step, you can go from your 2-millimeter twist drill to our number 2 uh, – 
two multi-drill, the number three multi-drill. If you're putting a 4.2 fixture, you would then go to the number four multi-drill. If you prefer to use less drills, you can go directly from the number two twist drill right to that number four multi-drill. From a cutting efficiency, the drills are designed to do that. So you have a choice of going step by step or to the two drill concept. I think for myself, I tend to use a two drill concept in areas where it may be difficult to access like the mandibular second molar region where I wanna uh, make it more efficient for the patient. And then a lot of other times, I might go from the two millimeter twist to the second to the last drill so I can feel the bone density and then decide how much I wanna use the final, the final drill. But overall, whether you're doing step by step or two drill concept, the uh, whole kit that we have has only um, only only six drills there. So you're going from a two millimeter twist and then through our multi drills that go numbered two through six. And if you're doing smaller diameter, you know, four and five millimeter diameter uh, fixtures, you're um, you know, very few drills that you need to use. And the whole kit is so nice and simple because all the implants have the same connection. You only have one type of delivery device to deliver the implants into place. So it's much less confusing and intimidating than most of the more conventional surgical kits that you've seen. And how much is a sur uh, introduction surgical kit? The, um, I actually have, uh, I want to make sure I, get the pricing right here right now at at this time uh little implant company it has uh launch uh specials that they're launching and so they have a special where for uh 30 implants which normally retailing at 156 dollars right now on the launch they're launching at 30 implants 97 dollars each so a total of 2910 and they're going to give you your surgical kit and prosthetic kit free with that purchase. And that's a limited time offer, but that still is running uh, right now as of uh, so how much is that today, total? February, so you February get, 11th. You get 30... $2,910 $2, for 30 implants and the surgical kit and the restorative kit. There's an adjustable uh, torque wrench included in that restorative kit. Uh, in the ratchet wrench as well as a straight driver in the uh, surgical. So it's pretty it, a pretty high value um, available for the quality of the product that we feel we're providing. The company is very streamlined. You know, how can you provide high quality at that kind of value? Well, it's a streamlined company. You, you don't have middlemen, but we do have am amazing customer service and we have our mentors available to help you. So the total kit's twenty nine ten. Well, that includes thirty implants. They're actually right, you're right. paying for the thirty implants and getting the kit with that. But here, but here's what I'm telling the kids. You know, the when you look at something for twenty nine hundred and ten dollars, you basically only have to do one or two implant cases, yes. and you get all your yep. money back. I mean, it's like people yep. who don't want to spend money learning Invisalign. It's like, dude, your yep. first Invisalign case would pay for your training back. Next question. If, if someone if someone wants to, to get all their money back in their first case, we have another option with only five implants for $1,995. That includes the surgical and prosthetic kit and five implants. So there in one case, they might be able to get all their investment back. And, and on that first implant, you know, she graduated from school. Uh, she's working for her mom, who's a dentist. Her mom doesn't place implants. Are you still recommending the first implant be placed in the first molar or maxillary second bicuspid? Is that the lowest hanging fruit or not really? I think that probably a lower first molar site or maxillary uh, second bicuspid is probably the easiest sites to start with. I think the maxillary uh, second bicuspid would be the least the least uh, stressful if they have a, a site with a relatively otherwise healthy healthy dentition um, just because they don't have the issue of the inferior alveolar uh, anatomy, nerve anatomy and it might be even less intimidating than a lower molar site and again that just depends on the size of the ridge and, and whether they have tomography available 
in their in their setting to uh, have measurements and things. So if you're listening to this, start looking and having your hygienist have everybody start looking for a maxillary missing second bicuspid. He's telling you that's the lowest hanging fruit. Um, is she going to need a CBCT? Well, I, that's what I was thinking, and I think in a maxillary second by sight, you're less likely to need to need need a cone beam CT of anywhere in the in the dentition. Um, myself, I've been using uh, 3D uh, tomography since I was in dental school, so I was fortunate that I uh, knew I was interested in implant dentistry and started treatment planning implants for me to restore when I was a sec end of my second year in dental school. So I actually, I actually had the opportunity to restore single teeth, uh, three and four unit prostheses, uh, maxillary uh, bar overdenture case, all, all while I was in dental school graduating back in 1994. Um, but once I, uh, and then moving on to my residency using again, uh, conventional, um, uh, CT scan radiology, and then I've been using cone beam CT scan since 2003. So for myself, I think there's great value uh, in simulation of surgery for implants. So m almost all my surgeries, I'm going to simulate on my computer, go through that process. So by the time I sit down to do the case, I've already done it digitally, and I, I know where I'm I'm going to be working as far as the implant placement. I also use a lot of surgical guides generated from the scans, but I've always been, I think if you're going to do, everything has to be restoratively based. So whether it's analog or digital, I've always been trained having a, a diagnostic workup or wax up and today it's mostly digital and then planning the implant placement based off of that. Wow. So you went to dental school at Tufts School of Dentistry, graduated in 94. Yes, I did. Then yes. Harvard in 97. But Tufts had CBCTs in 94? No, no. No, no. Those were uh, using conventional scans. CAT scans? Convention I, yep. Conventional CAT scans I used from when I was in dental school through 2003. And then to the, starting in 2003, I actually uh, would have scans done at Harvard for myself using a um, – cone beam scan and then getting those put into a software where I could do planning. I did my first uh, guided surgical uh, case in 2003. Wow. So I've been, work I've been working with guided surgery for, I'm in my 16th year of doing guided surgical cases. And I think from, you know, maybe 2006 to 2012, as the systems became more commercialized, in the ease of use, let me increase the amount that I that I that I would use it, and I think I use it more and more each year. You would say, well, you have a lot of experience; you don't need to use guided surgery, but I I just think it's a great tool in uh, increase the predictability. So I'm a big fan of. I want as much information as I can have, so I can have as much control of what of what I'm doing. So if, um, if you placed a hundred implants, how many of them would yeah. have a surgical guide? I would say the uh, let's say 20, 20 of them are immediate implants. Twenty out of twenty are probably not going to have a, a surgical guide. Maybe there's one central incisor that the tooth is sitting towards the buccal plate, and it's so it is an undercut. It's extremely offset, so maybe one out of that twenty might for uh, immediate extraction. But most of them, I'm going to simulate it on the computer, and just I'll know where I have to intersect the extraction socket and at what angle to get that placement. And then um, you know maybe there's a, another ten percent that have an anatomy like that second single second bicuspid with a huge ridge or big big jaw lower molar that doesn't require it and probably the other 70 percent are going to have uh guides that are generated from the ct scan through um stereolithic methods and 3d printing okay one of my biggest complaints on this show is that we don't mention brands so when you say a cbct uh, which one are you, they want to know which one you're using I'm using a, uh, a care stream in my practice and uh, right now a 9300 and then we'll be later this year we'll be putting in a new 9600 and I've had great experience with that. And that that's the same one I use but it's just coincidence uh, care stream didn't give us any money. Uh, there's no money changing hands on any of this stuff. Um, 
what if this what if this young dental student has this fantasy uh, in her head that with CBCC and surgical guides, she's never gonna have to see blood and bone and lay a flap. And and I mean, I've heard him say, you know, with a surgical guide and a CBCT, yeah. Stevie Wonder could place the implant. Do you, do you yeah. really think you can be an implantologist and not no. be bloody surgeon? I think you, I don't think you need to be invasive, but I think you need to ha have some very simple basic surgical skills and you want to be comfortable lifting the tissue and seeing the bone so you can understand exactly what that bone ridge looks like. The um, I think the most challenging place or place to make the most mistakes is in the maxillary uh, arch. And in the maxillary arch, it often looks like the, the ridge is nice and flat. In the tissue, it looks flat. But on the palatal side, it may angle off at 45 or 50 degrees. And you want to be centered on that ridge. And there's no way to really see that without making a flap. And if you have a, if you have a flat ridge that's 10 millimeters wide, yeah, you don't need to make a flap. But I don't see that very often. I can think of maybe three cases we did in the last 90 days with single tooth sites where I did not make a flap. I'm almost always making a small flap so I can see the bone. Um, if I have a site, again, as, uh, as a specialist, a lot of the single tooth sites I see were sites that had a lot of bone damage prior to me seeing the patient, fractured teeth, uh, deep endodontic infections. On those cases where I've done ridge preservation grafting, I want to see the bone and make sure that that bone is nice and solid on the surface. I, what I explain is that the most important bone for maintenance and health of that implant is going to be the part of the bone near the platform of the fixture. And so I think having learning some learning some basic surgical skills is is important. And I think with guided surgery, you need to first know the basics because what if that guide breaks in the middle of the surgery? What if what if the guide doesn't fit? You know, you need to be able to know how to abort from using the guide and uh, <laughs> support your, support yourself with the surgery. If you have a narrow ridge and you're drilling through the guide, you can't feel whether half the drill is in bone or all the drill is in bone. So you could create a, a time where you're drilling on the side of the bone, not in the bone, and um, that could be a challenge. Um you know, you want the tubes on those guides close to the bone, so there's as little chance to leverage off to the side. But I think that that would be a whole different education program focusing on guided surgery. I don't want to drift too far too far um, into that. Uh, you know, getting a little off course. I want to ask you some more um, quiz questions. If you placed 100 immediate implants immediate after um, surgical extraction. How many of those 100 would also be immediately loaded? Um, for myself and my practice, I would say, you know, fairly few because I'm pretty pretty conservative with that. You know, if, if you start looking at how much bone is holding the fixture, it's not that I don't look at the option. I always look at the option of what's going to be the fastest course of treatment for the patient. And most of the time, it tends to be can I get an immediate implant here or do I not have enough threads that are going to be holding the bone to put the immediate implant in? If I have a short root in a large ridge and we can uh, get a very nice primary stability very predictably and there wasn't much infection in that area before we started, yeah, that's going to be a good, good candidate for immediate placement, immediate load. But what I find in my practice is it, uh, most of the immediate, immediate loads for single teeth – I tend to do more 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 stage more often than not. It's just the type of of, of uh, teeth that I end up seeing. On the other hand, it's the larger cases where we're doing the full arch case where we're extracting teeth. Often those cases require some ridge reduction, so you're not really using so much of the bone where the socket is, you're using the basal bone where you have nice, strong, healthy bone. In those cases, you have more of the implant touching the bone, so more stability in those cases are great for immediate load where we're making the transition from uh, teeth that are failing and in one procedure taking out the teeth, 
in placing the fixtures and then uh, converting to a full arch prosthesis. Um, so uh, higher volume of that, I'd say, in my own practice than, than the single teeth immediate load. Getting back to the Mark Nevins dental implant system, we had the opportunity to do a 12-month uh, immediate load study and we did eight patients and 29 implants. And we had one, one case where the patient had uh, no bone through the maxillary anterior. And we only used two implants in the posterior on the left side. Um, and the other teeth holding the partial were mobile. It was a poor case selection. And on that case, the partial rocked onto the prosthesis. And those two implants failed. But the other 27 implants uh, that we placed were all successful with very good bone levels. We had a, a mean of only 0.6 millimeters of bone loss from the platform at the 12-month analysis. And those cases included uh, th uh, three and four tooth maxillary anterior segments, uh, two fully edentulous mandibles, a posterior sextant with three implants where there had been recent extractions, um, four sites where we did do immediate extractions, immediate placement, and immediate load. So it was a, a pretty arduous task uh, that we were asking on the implants in this study and uh, very nice results on that. We've submitted that to be published in the International Journal of Periodontics and Restorative Dentistry and we're working on the revision so that we can hopefully get that accepted and published later later this year. And your dad, Myron, started that magazine, right? Yep, in 1981, together with Gerald Kramer, and we edited that that together that we've done for quite some uh, time now. He, he may be the longest journal medical journal editor in history, having done that for 38 years, pretty impressive pretty impressive and then we co-chair the international symposium on periodontics and restorative dentistry which will be in boston this june 9th to 6th the uh uh symposium uh, sponsored by quintessence in the journal and um that's you know a great meeting to l learn more about uh dental implants and aesthetics and uh, periodontics has a, a great range over 60 uh, speakers from all over the world and usually we expect about 2,000 people in Boston for that great time to be here in June. So when your dad started that magazine the big thing was hydroxy appetite coating whatever happened to that that was that was the big rage and, and well, a lot of today, the reason I ask is because some of these kids see these ancient yeah. implants that we placed during the Flintstone era. Whatever happened to hydroxyapatite coating? Yeah, I mean, if you look at our implants today, we use uh, a sandblasted acid etched surface. We have a proprietary technique that we use to you know, increase the way that works on the surface area with the with the with the bone healing as well as special cleaning processes. But that surface is stable; it's not going to break down over time. Hydroxyapatite coatings are very nice that it draws the bone initially, but hydroxyapatite in most instances is then resorbable. And the problem is, once that starts to resorb, you may get some negative changes as far as the way the bone is adapting to the implant, depending on what the surface is underneath and how that's affected by the resorption process. And some of those uh, hydroxyapatite crystals are going to resorb during the first year. Some of them are designed that will take much slower. They might take three to seven years to resorb, but once they resorb, you, patient specific, you may see some issues with that. So we look, we want a more stable uh, surface to the implant today. And um, you know, there've been, even today you can find some HA surfaces, but I would recommend a more stable implant surface like a sandblasted acid etched type, uh, titanium that we have. Well, you know, um, <clears throat> following up on that hydroxyapatite coating, um, a lot of a lot of kids are scared about implants because after five to ten years they see you know maybe a third to a half of these having periimplantitis. Um, do you think um, removing the hydroxyapatite coating and going to these different services reduce that a little bit or a lot or what is as a Harvard trained well, periodontist think, what is what are we looking I, at with periimplantitis? You know I think a I think the, the first component is to make sure that we have enough quantity of healthy bone as well as healthy gingival tissue at the site of where we're placing the implant. And uh, good diagnostics, good uh, basic surgical skills, 
learning uh, basic approaches to ridge preservation and uh, as well as soft tissue management surgically, these all have an effect. So if you have a choice of using a tissue punch, but you don't, you're going to lose the attached gingiva that would then be there around the implant. Well, if you make a small mini flap and make that incision in a way that you can move gingiva around that implant, we now have a lot of papers over the past 15 years that really support the clinical benefit of having that attached gingiva around the implant. And I think a lot of peri-implantitis is due to the condition at the time of surgery and the condition as a result of how the bone and tissue healed around that implant originally that leaves it susceptible. In addition to that, having a, an implant design and an implant surface technology that's going to stand the test over time, uh, such as the Mark Nevins implant system, is going to be very important. So we, we, we have seen over the years some implant-specific um, types of problems. I think in addition to that, going back to the question about implant designs, you know, there are certain designs that biologically are more challenging. And when you take things like micro-threading at the top of the fixture, in my experience, uh, there's a, a certain percentage of the population of patients that just doesn't hold bone well on that micro-threading. And so those patients, even after one or two years, are going to be starting with lower bone levels. So it's a multifactorial disease, if you want to call periimplantitis a disease, and it's related to surgical factors, it's related to implant design factors, and then there are biological aspects. If you... Um, decide that you're going to uh, finish with a second bicuspid and that implant's going to have a, a crown to root ratio that's twice the crown compared to the implant size and the patient has second molar occlusion in the opposite arch, you might over occlude that implant and put pressure on it. We might get occlusal related bone loss. On the other hand, we can also have uh, plaque induced inflammation and bone loss around implants. So there's a lot of different factors. In addition to that, there's been a, a lot of uh, publications on cement being the anitis for inflammation and bacterial infiltration. So we want to make sure that if we're cementing implant restorations, that we're designing uh, our abutment so that cement's not going to be uh, getting too far subgingival. Um, we may have a vent in the crown to also let the excess cement, cement get out. It's, it's a great, great question, a very, very important area, and there's a lot of factors that have an impact on it. I think what you said <clears throat> was so genius because when you talk to periodontists about periimplantitis, a lot of them go right back to the, the prevention and think a lot of it has to do with you place this correct with nice attached gingiva all the way around it. That is the majority of the problem. And when you're placing these implants and they're not in attached gingiva, um, then you can open up a whole host of problems. I want to pin your feet down to a very controversial question. Um, LANAP, LAPIP. Um, it, the reason it's a serious question is because on Dental Town, um, most half the people just go there and read it like the daily newspaper, today's active topics, whatever. But when it ever gets to be a hundred thousand dollars decision, I see their searches. They'll go in and search Lanap, periimplantitis, Lapip, because it's like a hundred and thirty-five thousand dollars to get up to speed on that. So it's a yes or no question. Do you think the my homies listening to you should invest a hundred and thirty-five grand in a laser to help with the treatment of um, periimplantitis? I think that or do you want to plead the fifth as far as, <laughs> well I think what I'm going to say is that the the research supporting LANAP to treat periodontal disease has definitive proof of principle for periodontal regeneration and that is a study that I've published as well as a study that Ray Yuckton has published but in our paper that we published we showed definitively on a diseased root surface with a calculus notch and measurements to where that notch was before we root planed, periodontal regeneration with new cementum, periodontal ligament, and new alveolar bone on previously diseased root surfaces. If you came to my practice this afternoon and present with periodontal disease that I think should be treated surgically, 
I'm going to make a treatment plan to treat your dentition with LANAP. That is going to be my first course of treatment in my practice to treat your dentition with periodontal disease. And I'm going to be remarkably successful with that treatment almost all the time. If I have a tooth that is a hopeless prognosis, most of the time I'm going to prescribe extraction of that tooth for the reasons why I've described it as a hopeless prognosis, not a guarded prognosis, but I've also treated a lot of teeth that uh, patients have refused to extract with guarded to hopeless prognosis very successfully with LANAP. I've been doing LANAP since 2009, so I'm starting uh, however many years it is, I guess my 11th year with that, and um, have had a lot of success with it. I think when you switch over to the implant topic and you talk about do you want to purchase a laser specifically to treat periimplantitis? We run into two problems. The first problem is we just stated that periimplantitis is an extremely multifactorial disease. And we need to figure out the etiology in each specific case. And then we need to make an assessment. Is this a case that I should be removing the implant? Is it a case that I should be treating non-surgically? Or is it a case that I should be treating surgically? And then we have to make a decision, is it a case for surgical treatment with bone grafting or a case that can be managed minimally invasively with a laser-based treatment? My problem is that I don't have enough data to show me the predictability for treating periimplantitis with any approach. I have lots of approaches which work, but it's such a multifactorial disease that if you said to me, Mark, you have to now limit your practice to just treating periimplantitis and you can't remove the implants, I would be afraid to take responsibility for that treatment because I can't predict which case it's going to work and which it won't. I could show you many cases where I've used laser treatment around implants and had improved or stabilized very nice results, but the predictability of that is going to be much less than I am with treating periodontal disease around teeth, and a lot of that relates to the multifactorial aspect of the disease. So it's a long, long-winded uh, uh, question, um, but uh, LANAP is my first course of surgical care for treating periodontal uh, disease in my practice, and uh, I hope that gives you some insight into the question. I want to ask you another controversial question. <clears throat> Bone grafting after placement. The patient, you know, money's the answer. What's the question? I'm in pain. I want this tooth pulled. I don't know when I'm going to uh, replace it with an implant or a bridge or a partial or a flipper or whatever. Yeah. Some people say that the bone grafting um, really only makes sense if they come back and get the implant within one calendar year. True or false? Yeah, I don't think that's. I think I think that's false. I think the only I think if you bone graft an extraction socket, the only way that you that you're going to lose that bone is if you have a removable prosthesis that's putting pressure on it. So I think if you don't bone graft it, we know from the research that within six weeks you're going to lose forty percent of the volume. Let alone by the time you get to twelve weeks, how much you might lose, in most cases. Um, so I'm a big proponent of interceptive grafting at the time of extraction and you call uh, it interceptive case, grafting well well it's rich preservation or extraction socket grafting my point is if you come back to that site six months later or a year later you know you now have to do surgical procedure as opposed to a very simple uh socket graft if, if you don't graft that site and you decide a year later you want an implant and now your ridge is three millimeters wide instead of eight millimeters wide, you have to come in and do a ridge augmentation procedure. On the other hand, at the day of extraction, most of the time I can manage that with a flapless approach. For myself, I'm using bone allograft, mineralized allograft from uh, Base Bone, which is a product that Little Implant Company sells. and um, um, most of the time in my socket grafting, mixing that with recombinant human platelet drive growth factor, which is a uh, recombinantly or biotech engineered uh, growth factor. It's marketed as Gem21S and sold now by Lynch Biologics. And 
I can just take I can take any tooth socket, no matter how much bone loss, if it's a fracture, whatever's going on, and manage that with a flapless approach, just packing the allograft soaked in the growth factor into that socket. So that's a procedure that someone without a lot of surgical experience can learn to do very easily, whereas a ridge augmentation is a much more uh, surgical experience required process, and it's much more invasive for the patient. So I'm a big proponent of doing preservation grafting procedures at the time of extraction. It, it makes things easier. It keeps the options for implants open for that patient. A lot of patients don't know what it's going to be like missing that tooth before it's extracted. They're going to come back two months later and say, wow, I really want an implant. When can I have that? And now if we've lost the bone, it puts us in a compromised position. So I think we have to take the time to educate the patients before we do the extraction. And we have to explain to them it's going to be more invasive, take more time, cost significantly more to go in and do an augmentation procedure as opposed to just doing a preservation procedure and getting in there at the time of the extraction. Okay, so uh, again, walk her through. I mean, wh where is she going to learn to bone graft or ridge preservation after she extracted a tooth? And wh where is she going to learn that? And what did you say that you sell for that? Well, she, do, you, do you have the course Mar too? March 9th, March 9th in San Antonio. T next month, we have a course on uh, surgical principles of atraumatic tooth removal, immediate implants, and bone grafting. And then we have another course uh, with the same topic on April 26th and 27th. So we have two courses coming up in the next two months focused just on that topic, teaching atraumatic tooth removal. We don't want to damage the gum tissue. We don't want to damage the bone. What I explained to the patient is I want to – I want the site to look like I made the tooth just disappear when I finished extracting the tooth. There's usually almost no bleeding. The gum tissue looks perfectly like it did when the patient walked in, and I haven't damaged the bone. And um, that's what we want them to learn. And then, uh, as I said, Little Implant Company sells uh, base bone, uh, uh, bone allograft, which is a uh, freeze-dry bone allograft. It uses a very – uh, you, unique um, uh, treatment with a high concentration CO2 as part of the process. So the bone is basically um, uh, uh, free of any bacteria or viruses without having to be exposed to extremely high doses of radiation, which helps maintain the biologic potential of the bone. And um, it's also been very specifically designed by dental surgeons to have a handling characteristic as well as a size and shape of the bone particulate that's going to be optimal for bone healing. And define allograft. Allograft is cadaverous human sourced bone, which then goes through a uh, alcohol dehydration process. And in our case, this also then goes through a treatment with a high concentrated CO2 uh, and between those processes, it's uh, free of any bacteria or viruses and uh, is extremely safe to use. Freeze-dry bone allograft dates back to use in, in, in dentistry to about 1976, 1977 um, in the United States. So it's been around for quite some time. You also could use xenografts like a bovine bone particulate if you prefer that. Um, I would prefer... Uh, uh, not to use an alloplastic material myself. Um, I think your, my results are are best in my my hands with allograft and xenograft. And specifically for socket grafting, I like the allograft. When you go to a xenograft, you have a high heat processing, and that's going to mean that the the uh, bone might be a little more micro dense, meaning it needs more blood supply. And if you have a, a flapless healing in an extraction socket, you're you're always going to have a, a little bit of compromise to a blood supply compared to in a submerged surgical site. So is your first uh, so basically on a um, on an allograft where you're going yeah. for it'd be like me donating bone to you would but wouldn't your first cho choice to be you donating bone from your own body to another sort is that your first pick and then it no. just I, I no not today you know the the only time that I use autogenous bone grafting at all today in my practice is for severe vertical ridge augmentations. 
And there I'm using it combined with growth factor in a xenograft or an allograft. And for extraction socket grafting, you could have a, all the buck. If you come in tomorrow to my practice and you had a, a fractured uh, lower molar and you were busy the past month with your with your uh, podcast, so you didn't have time to get it extracted, even though you noticed something was going on, and you have 100% of the buckle plate missing, and you have a little half centimeter cyst apical to the tooth, I'm going to treat that with a flapless approach. I'm going to section the tooth, remove it atraumatically, perhaps with piezo surgery, debride and degranulate the defect, and then I'm going to take the base bone allograft. I'll soak that with some uh, the GEM21S liquid growth factor, pack that into the defect, put a little collagen membrane on the surface with a little medical grade uh, glue, and I'm going to get all the healing I need for my implant without ever opening the gum, without advancing the gum to cover, without you having swelling, and uh, you know, really highly simplified, and then I can come back at four months later and place my Mark Nevins implant. I'll have solid bone. Okay, now I want to move above the bone and tissue and all that kind of stuff. Um, you talk about how you have a one prosthetic platform. What, what, yes. What, so, what, what do you mean by a one prosthetic platform? So what we mean is whether you – whichever diameter fixture you're using – the connection is going to be the same. So there's a 3.5 millimeter internal hexagon on the uh, at the top surface of the implant, and the abutment will fit into that. You can place the same abutment into our 385 implant that you can our 6.0 implant. So it makes it very simple. Um, it also means the healing caps, you might choose a slim or a regular or wide, depending how you want to shape the tissue, but the connection is the same. We have uh, digital scan bodies if you prefer to take a digital uh, uh, impression registration, and then we obviously have conventional impression copings for either closed tray or open tray, and we have a full array of rest restorative components, whether you want uh, prefabricated abutments uh, anatomic shape prefabricated abutments or whether you want to make a customized abutments. We have tie bases if you want to uh, have a, uh, uh, a zirconia uh, abutment cemented to a tie base, a titanium base to that. Uh, full array of prosthetic solutions. We also have multi-unit abutments, which is what we're mostly using for our, uh, those immediate load edentulous cases that we talked about, um, which work very well. So a full array armamentarium. And where or how, where do you make your, do you make your own surgical guides? Do you send them to a lab? What, what's the deal there? Um, most of my surgical lies, guides are uh, made by, uh, depending whichever software I'm using for the three, 3D uh, simulation analysis. So, for example, if I was using um, si uh, materialized Simplant, that's going to uh, be then shipped directly from them once I plan the case. There are there are some systems that allow you to have your own 3D uh printer in your office. I haven't um, done 3D printing of my own guides um, up but, to this but do you point have a in time specific, Do you have a specific name or website of one place where she can get her surgical guides made? Um, do you have the, any recommendations? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, for someone who has um, uh, is just getting started, I think the um, Good options include uh, 3DDX. 3D, say it again, 3DDX. Yep, Simplant. And um, th there's a new company that's just entering the marketplace, which is really easy to use because you can plan it on your phones and an iPad, which is 3DME, uh, which, will, which will be available later this year. And, um, and so there's different approaches. There are some softwares you need to you need to have a, a full license, and other ones you can do case by case. And um, you know each company has different options for that. Do you still use piezo surgery? I do. I use it every day. T t she might not even know what it is. What what is piezo surgery, yep. and why do so you still use I it? It's an ultrasonic technology, and the uh, original piezo surgery from uh, Mectron actually works on a dual a dual wave 
uh, piezoultrasonic frequency. And the reason for a dual wave is if you are using the instrument to cut the bone and the pressure interrupted one of the waves, if it only had one wave, you might burn the bone. By having a dual wave working parallel, you can put pressure to cut the bone and it's going to cut in a smooth fashion. And my most typical use for it is I use a scale, a scalar tip on it and use that to go down into the PDL. So that broken tooth we were taking out, I would section it into a mesial root and a distal root as a lower molar. And then I would use my piezo ultrasonic uh, uh, scalar tip to go down in the PDL space and make it so I can very easily remove that root. I like to say that a cotton plier is my favorite forcep because I can use the piezo surgery oftentimes and then just lift the root right out of place. Um, not always that quite that easy, but um, it's really a helpful armamentarium. Um, some people are don't want to get into implant surgery <clears throat> because they don't know if they're really into drawing blood and spinning platelets and, and no, 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 I don't, I, I don't do any of that. The the growth factors that we that we that I use today are biotech engineered. So it comes in a little half milliliter vial, um, and the the uh, potency. The, if you take uh, platelet gel, it's a whole series of growth factors, and those growth factors work synergistically. And I started uh, using those in about the year two thousand, and what I found was the potency of that platelet gel wasn't quite enough to change the paradigm of the types of procedure, procedures I was doing. Like when we talk about that flapless extraction socket, even with a lot of bone loss, it wasn't until I had a biotechnology growth factor that I could purchase off the shelf where the concentration of PDGF was a thousand times what I could get in platelet gel that I saw a healing pattern that changed the way I was able to practice. So I don't do any uh, blood drawing and spinning down in my own practice. I know it's very popular today, but I think you have to really look deep into the uh, science in, to weigh out how much clinical uh, benefit there is to the patient with the biology of the, heal of the healing, healing with that. Well, you know who was not a big fan of drawing blood and, and doing all that? No. Carl Misch. Okay. Uh, I did a podcast with Carl before he passed on, and um, he he thought it was unnecessary to draw blood and all that kind of stuff. And it was the most controversial thing he said uh, on that um, that interview. I don't know if it's because I I don't know why, but it seems it seems like many many humans like to make everything more complicated than they have to. Um, it, it's 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 a um it's a very bizarre mind just to keep it simple, stupid. Uh, they just uh, always want to make a mountain of them. I, I don't see how it would be a practice builder telling your patient, oh, yeah, and we're also going to have to draw blood. <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, for, pe for people who are doing sedation, they're already setting up an IV line. But I did find when we were doing that um, many years ago now that it did create quite more anxiety than you would expect for the patients. Yeah. Yeah, I want to embarrassingly tell you how I um, fell into implants. I got my diplomat in the International Congress for Implantology. So I I had learned right out of the gate that whenever you went to a dental course, the dentists that really were happy and had successful practices and were, were making money and er everything great about them, they always were had their FAGD or their MAGD. So I said, okay, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna copy that. And then in getting my um, AGD, I looked at the deals and I had to take all these classes on implant dentistry. So I told the guy in Arizona, well, I, I don't want to take those because I don't do implants. I want to have, I want to do those with more fillings. And he said, well, it, you have to, end of story. And I was so mad. So I looked and say, to find a curriculum where I could just take one course and get that whole damn FAGD out of the way. And it was Carl Misch's seven three day weekend course in Pittsburgh, and what, and what I'm telling course. you, and I'm telling you, this guy's got, I mean, come on, guys, um, you, you're gonna have to hustle. He's got a, a two day mini residency for four grand uh, coming up in um, um, March twenty second in um, Lexington, Kentucky, and then March twenty eighth in Kansas City, Kansas. That's where I went to dental school. That's the most rocking hot town. And then San Antonio, that's the boardwalk, dude. You, I mean, the boardwalk has gotta be one of the coolest places um, out. Then he's got another one, and then he's got him again repeating um, in all those cities. But 
my gosh, you look at that course and at 2,500 bucks, dude, you're gonna place two implants and get your money back. And you, you gotta just, the journey of a yeah, thousand those, miles those, those, starts those, with one step. Yeah, and the, in, in, the, in the mini residencies, they can, uh, they're basically getting the surgical instrumentation in the first five implants as part of the tuition. So, you know, our goal, as I said, is to um, give people the support they need to get the experience or build from where they are and provide the mentoring. We feel that, I know that, that uh, we have a system that's much simpler, much easier to use. And uh, we've had a very good response um, so far with uh, the people have had experience with it and really excited about uh, the growth to come this year and getting it in the hands of more clinicians and uh, getting the process to grow. So we're excited about it. Can I, and I, and I want you, um, the world seems to be getting crazier as I get older and older. I don't think, I don't think people were this crazy uh, when I was in uh, high school, but you, Tucson right now, you can't even get a hotel room in Tucson. I'm in Phoenix, 90 miles down the street, an hour and a half, because they're having a, um, oh my God, what is it? A crystal, crystal convention, and it's all these crystals, and they heal all these things. And one of the big things now is people come in and they want metal free. Um, do you think that? Well, I, um, I mean, we could, have, we could have a big argument as to whether, as to what metal free means. So what's your solution for metal free? Is that zir zirconia? Cause we could argue whether zirconia is really, it's white, but is it a metal? I mean, so I don't see any biologic reason to go to anything other than titanium. For myself, if you're my patient and you want a zirconia implant, then I'll let you refer yourself to someone who wants to place those. But I will stay with titanium myself. Okay, so true or false? Do you think patients are ha that some patients are having allergies to medical grade titanium? No, I think I do not. I think if you go back uh, ten years ago, you had some companies that were using some alloys that had uh, more additives in it, and there could theoretically have been patient that had reaction to some of those additives and um, something like nickel, for example. Over the past, I'd say between five and eight years, almost all companies have gone to uh, uh, types of titanium alloy that are much more pure. And I think in today's, in today's uh, marketplace with a reputable company, um, it's extremely, extremely unlikely that you would come across um, uh, something that would have a, an allergic reaction. Well, I, um, I'm in Ahwatukee. It's actually Phoenix, but everybody calls it Ahwatukee. And me and my drinking buddies, uh, we always refer those crazy patients to the same dentist. <laughs> yeah, but anyway. Um, well, I, yeah, I mean, I, I would go back to you know, even 10, 15 years ago, de a couple of dentists that practiced quote unquote, holistic dentistry, they still supported dental implants. So if it was okay, then it seems to me it's okay now. Well, you just walked into a trap door because then I'm going to have the biggest threat on dental town is Netflix has a movie called Root Cause. Yeah. And I I'm haven't telling, seen, I haven't seen it though, so I don't know if I should. I, I probably will have no comment then because I haven't seen it, well, I, but I've heard about it, and it, it sounds very alarming. It's very huge, and I'll sum up the entire hour long movie in five minutes. There's no other surgeons in medicine that leave a dead organ in your body. This tooth is dead, they're leaving a dead tooth in your body, and that starts the whole cascade to badness and rottenness and i mean you just you know no one leaves it no one leaves a dead appendix in your body or a dead kidney or you know but anyway it, it's so bizarre uh, but they did find four dentists to go on to the movie and talk about it and if you haven't seen the movie you need to see the movie because your patients see the movie like some people always say yeah why do you post some of the stuff that you do on dental town um you know maybe it's negative towards dentistry um and and like the one i'm getting a, the most complaints about today do, do you see how i said that the most complaints today i get complaints a lot and i'll just tell you why i do this um i posted 
um, this article yesterday that's hugely searched late on the internet that says, um, Mark was told he needed $1,200 worth of dental fillings. He needed six dental fillings. He went to another dentist and the other dentist said he didn't need any fillings. And people are said, asking me, why do you post this negative stuff? Because your patients are reading it. I know you're a dentist. I didn't know you were so sensitive. You live in a bubble. But so again, um, you, you, I don't know if you're old enough to remember the Reader's Digest article. Are you old enough to remember that when Reader's Digest came out with that? Um, no. You're, you're, okay, so it was a long time ago. I just got out of school and Reader's Digest, there was no internet. The Reader's Digest was on everybody's uh, nightstand and their most prestigious uh, journalist, William Eckenbarger, who won several awards, he says, how dentists rip us off. And what William Eckenberger did is he took his FMX and study models to 30 different dentists and by God, he got 30 different opinions. What, what does that mean to you when um, your patients, if, if they went to, is it that way with periodontists? If, if, if a patient went to 30 different periodontists, how many treatment plans do you think you'd get? At least 29. Yeah. yeah. So dentistry, is, I mean, it's 2019. It, there's a lot of art. There's a lot of science. Um, but it's, uh, you know, just, it just is what it is. Um, so, uh, so I, I want to ask you some more, do you, you have time? I can't believe we already, yeah, Oh my God. We're, oh my God. We went way over. Um, but I, another question, um, she's going to be looking for a missing maxillary second by cuspid. You said that was the lowest hanging fruit. The, she can look at that, but you yeah, know what she sees a lot of, she sees a lot of edentulous people. She sees a lot of people coming in for a denture. And the patient wants a reline. Do you make a new? What, what do you? What do you? What can yep. you do to help I a denture? Edentulous. I think. I think another. You know, a, a great area for huge patient benefit is a simple overdenture with uh, two implants in the lower interior, and um, fantastic solution. So more sophisticated treatment is obviously to, to do a fixed case on implants. And I think, you know, probably doing your, your first case being a, a, a fixed case with uh, four, four or five implants is going to need a little more assistance than a uh, overdenture or a single tooth site uh, to, st to start with. But we do have, for those with more experience, we are offering um, courses focused on the edentulous case to give people the confidence and training uh, for those types of cases as well. But no, I mean, implant dentistry continues to, to really be the most powerful thing, I think, in dentistry today. And it's just amazingly rewarding part of practice. The patient appreciation of what we're doing for them is incredible. And um, yeah, we want to make it easier for people to get more experience and, and to grow successfully with it. And I just want to tell you young kids who are so worried about your student loan debt, I've seen in my 31 years, I've seen a lot of dentists come out of school and buy an $800,000 office and then didn't realize that they, they couldn't diagnose and treatment plan. They couldn't, they couldn't do the, the, the molar endo the guy was doing and they're referring that out. And, and they took an $800,000 a year practice and ran it down to 600, but bought it for the full 800. Whereas on the other side, the biggest return on investment practice I've ever seen where somebody buys a practice for 300,000 and within one or two years, it's doing 3 million a year is they go down <clears throat> to the poorest part of town and buy the old denture world clinic than some small building in the poorest part of town where all the retirees and trailers are and all that kind of stuff and they never did implants and they bring in an implant armentarian and they start offering the upgrade here's the denture we advertise the whole denture for you know 250 but here's a nicer denture for 500 with more nicer prettier teeth and then here's a denture on two implants and then here's a denture all on four and they start upselling 10 20 percent of these people that were coming in for just a reline like they've been doing for 20 30 40 years in these places in florida and south carolina poor flyover state america and the next thing you know this dentist is placing a hundred implants a month so you know um so i'm just gonna ask you in america 
the country you were born in. For every person that pays $25,000 for an all on four, how many Americans buy an all on none? Probably a lot, right? Probably what, 100 to one? Yeah, I would think so. So that's the market. Instead of trying to learn how to do an all on four for somebody that comes to your practice, I mean, you know how many people come in my office that can pay $25,000 an arch and give me 50 grand for two all on fours? Okay, for every one of them, I'll get a hundred that have a denture and they're coming in because it's loose and it needs a reline or yep. they've had a weight change. Over, you know, yeah, they, they've the lost it. Yeah. It's, it's, it's life changing just getting them those two implants in an overdenture. Yeah. It really is. La last question, because uh, you, you've been so nice with your time. It's uh, when you get a, a doctor on from Harvard, you don't want to let them off too fast. But back to restorative, um, do you recommend cementing or screwing? Well, I think in in uh, cases where it's amen uh, amenable and it's and it's uh, fiscally affordable, it's nice to be able to have a, sc a screw retain restoration and not have any, any cement. And then the other times where um, it just might be more affordable to use a prefab abutment and do do more of a crown and bridge style uh, cemented restoration. So you can do both. You just want to make sure you're not leaving any cement subgingivally uh, to create any problems. So. And, and my second last to the last question, the Chinese placed an implant with nothing other than a robot. Are you in fear of losing your job anytime soon? I'm really not. I'm okay. <laughs> well, what, what did you think of that feed? And, do you, and how long do you think it'll be before the bread and butter implant is placed by a, a robot? Well, I think it gets back to your question about blood and whether you need to do, do surgery. And, um, if for myself, I still think there's value in being able to open the gum and see the surface of the bone and know exactly where I'm, I'm working, then, um, probably we're, you know, it's a, it's a nice, uh, example of what can be done with technology, but I don't see that, uh, making it into our every day, every day over the, over the next few years, anytime too soon. Well, hey, um, my last question is I'm begging you. Um, we put up 400 online CE courses on Dentaltown. They're all ADA approved, AGD approved. They're coming up on a million views. It would be amazing privilege and credibility if you ever took the time to uh, put an online CE course on Dentaltown uh, or write an article on this. Um, I, I think it's something that uh, would be amazing. Would you ever be up for that? Well. I'd be more than happy to do that, and you and I can follow up with that, and we'll see see how fast we can get it done. Okay, and then and and then uh, last again, least um, to follow up with you. You're the head on show, um, but if you, uh, well, I think it'd be fun to follow up with uh, your other uh, guys, Tony Fett, Gary, uh, David, Pamela Ray. If uh, any yeah. of them want to, if any of them hear this podcast and want to come on and share even more, yeah, uh, than what you did, uh, send them my way. That, that That'd be great. I think our clinical director is David Little, and I'd love to, to see if we could get him on with you sometime in the next month. So I will put him in touch with you. And tell him I'll even uh, fly down and visit him because I have five grandchildren and four of them live in Beeville, Texas, which is only an hour. So I've been flying into right. San Antonio a lot. Love the Riverwalk. Love well, Dave Little. And uh, thank you so much for coming on my show today and spending an hour in my home. I really appreciate it. It is a pleasure.